I'm Lexi, and this is What You Should Know. So, I have some exciting news, if you've not already seen it plastered all over my social media. Whisker has its own merch now. I was originally going to go the long way about it, order some stickers, buy some bottles, and create my own emotional support water bottles. But far out, it went horribly wrong. The bottles that came were so very damaged. Like, to the point where it looked like they came flying off a dirt bike at speed. And Australia Post even had to repackage it. But the good news is, rather than colourful plastic bottles, you can now get metal bottles that are an emotional support water bottle. Or you can get a sticker. Or you can get whisker mugs. I mean, come on, how cool is that? Keep an eye out, there will be more. And if you have any suggestions for other merch you want, please let me know, as I will get to designing it as quickly as I can. Now, that's enough rambling. This week we will be discussing a brutal crime, so I would love to give a trigger warning as it pertains to crimes against a child. If you can't stomach this case, please click off. I promise to try for something a little bit lighter in the next few episodes. But on that note, this is what you should know about the disturbing murder of Kylie Mabry. Kylie Maria Antonia Mabry was born on the 24th of October 1978 and in the year 1984 was six years old and full of life. She lived with her younger sister Rebecca and their mother Julie on Gregory Grove in Victoria. She was coming to the end of her second year in school where she'd been described as bright and playful as it was popular to do during the 1980s and continued on for many years later, Kylie was also enrolled in calisthenics. The little girl was with her mother, visiting their neighbour on Gregory Grove in East Preston, when she was sent to the nearby shop to buy sugar at about 5.30, just 100 metres down the road. This was a task that should not have taken very long at all. This was a task that should not have taken long, but by 6pm, Julie was worried and left with the neighbour to search for her little girl. A woman approached the neighbour to say a girl matching Kylie's description had been driven away in a white Holden station wagon. It was this information that the police were notified and began the search. In the early hours of the 7th of November, Kylie's body was found in a gutter on Donald Street, Preston, which was shockingly close to where she lived. Early in the investigation, it was theorised that she may have been held prisoner for more than seven hours before her body was dumped. In a newspaper article published on the 8th of that month, Detective Inspector Peter Ryan of the Homicide Squad was quoted as saying, Kylie was the victim of a vicious rape and died as a result of that rape, and probably shock. Another detective, who was not named, was quoted as saying, This was a particularly vicious attack carried out by what could only be described as a monster. She was confirmed as being seen alive about 5pm on Tuesday when she walked to the Food Plus store on Plenty Road, Preston. The store owner was also quoted in this article, saying she remembered selling Kylie a bag of sugar, which the child placed in a carry bag. It would take a further two weeks for the police to find the carry bag that Kylie had with her, a pink strawberry shortcake bag. An autopsy was performed on little Kylie in hopes to gain a greater understanding of what happened to her when she was taken. It was confirmed by the trauma on her body that six-year-old Kylie had been raped and during that horrific act, this monster suffocated her to death. When the results came back, they also found that she had a substantial amount of Valium in her system. Of course, the initial question was asked if Kylie was taking Valium medicinally. However, her mother stated this was not the case. Unfortunately for the times of 1984, DNA testing was not yet invented. The only evidence that was available was semen on the underpants of Kylie. The publicity for this case was extensive, and as it was on Melbourne Cup Day, she was referred to as Cup Day Girl. But it would be over 30 years before her killer was found. In the beginning, Julie's brother Mark and her father John Moss were initially treated as suspects, as they were both known for allegedly having unusual sexual habits. Mark even told police, weeks after Kylie was murdered, that he thought his father might have done it. However, John denied this claim, and in an interview with journalist Jim Tennyson, he said there was no way that Kylie would have gotten a car with a stranger. Both Mark and John were eventually ruled out as suspects. 
However, the unfortunate reality was it was too late, and the stress of being considered suspect had taken its toll. Just one year shy of the first anniversary of Kylie's murder, John Moss committed suicide. Tragedy continued for the family, as in February of 1987, Mark Mabry hanged himself in his cell at Pentridge Prison, leaving behind a note allegedly claiming to have murdered two pedophiles. It was with clearing the two deceased men that the investigating detectives found that they were back to square one. A $50,000 award was announced in 1985 with the hope that someone out there would come forward with crucial information or knowledge of the murder. Investigators had hoped two anonymous callers who called the police with information would come forward to clarify details. The first witness phoned the police on November the 21st, 1984, about a Holden Kingswood station wagon they asserted was involved with Kylie's death. The second caller rang Crime Stoppers in May of 1997 and nominated a person of interest who may be able to assist with the investigation. In 2016, Victorian police put out a call for a young Italian girl who approached Julia's neighbour on the day of Kylie's disappearance. Time passed sadly, with no new leads until the 1990s, when a new suspect came to the surface. Robert Arthur Selby Lowe. He came to attention on June the 29th of 91, when it was reported that Cherie Beasley had gone missing. It took a while for what happened to be pieced together, but when they did, it was reported that she was abducted by Robert Lowe, a Sunday school teacher, church elder, and travelling salesman. He apparently targeted Cherie because he had seen her alone several times previously. After the abduction, several witnesses said they had seen a middle-aged man driving a car containing a distressed child. Robert had a history of crimes involving children. Before Cherie's murder, he had multiple offences of indecent exposure, which had been aimed at young girls. It was months after the murder, when he was seeing a therapist because he was having marital problems. His therapist, Margaret Hobbs, eventually began to suspect that he was involved in the murder of Cherie, due to some of his suspicious statements, saying that he did not remember where he was on the day that Cherie died, and he felt the police were closing in on him. During this investigation, Cherie's friend with whom she was riding testified a man had forced her into a car and Robert was eventually convicted of Cherie's rape and murder. It was these similarities of the victim being a six-year-old girl that was raped and strangled to death that initially caught the eye of investigators. As they started looking into Robert as a suspect, it came to light that he had confessed to two prisoners that he had abducted Cherie. He had told them that Cherie's pink tracksuit had been dumped in a rubbish bin at the Mount Waverley shopping centre as it had been covered with semen. This clothing was never found. And fellow prisoner Peter Reed said that Robert had proudly boasted about how he'd cleaned the driveway under the car after cleaning up Cherie's blood. He said also, he said also, that he had learned his lesson this time, and next time he would use Valium. Detectives felt this was definitely enough to pin Robert for the murder of Kylie with circumstantial evidence. But they wanted more. They wanted to give the jury not an ounce of doubt to move on. And so with that, once it was available, DNA testing was performed on the semen that was found against Robert Lowe. This was not a match, and the case went cold. Victoria Police began a new investigation into the murder alongside other cold cases in 2014. Media interest in the case led to numerous suspects being reported to the police, but it wouldn't be until June of 2016 when the monster who did this would be arrested. In a 2017 article, Kylie's mother recounted when police knocked on her door one day and told her they had received a tip that Gregory Keith Davies could be the killer. Gregory had lived just 500 metres down the road from where Kylie had vanished. Julie was quoted as saying, I wanted to kill him. I broke down. The tears were running down my eyes and I knew he did it. This case honestly breaks my heart and boils my blood for so many reasons. In 1997, someone allegedly very close to Gregory anonymously told police that they should investigate him in regards to Kylie's murder and yet he wasn't charged until nearly 20 years after that. But sadder still is that it was known that Gregory is a pedophile who abused children, and it was known before Kylie's death. If someone had taken this knowledge seriously and acted accordingly, not only would there be significantly less people who would fall victim to him, but Kylie may still be alive, and perhaps so would her uncle and grandfather.
Gregory's mother, Eileen, allegedly knew her son was sexually abusing children for decades and frustratingly took no action. It was the same for his third wife. Even in the late 90s, at Ararat Prison, while he was part of a rehabilitation program, both women sat and listened as he read out details of his sexual abuse of six children. Both women continued to stand by him and kept this horrific behaviour a secret from others. Even more upsetting is that Gregory managed to avoid jail in 1984 over sexually assaulting four other children because police allegedly talked them out of pressing charges by saying it would be too traumatic for the children to go through the court process. If this had been addressed appropriately at the time, because I don't know when in 84 this was, there is still a chance that Kylie would be alive. And if it is true that police had said that, it should be looked into and action should be taken to one degree or another. A lot of Gregory's surviving family is horrified by the way they had found out of his perverse interest in children. His daughter, who in all articles has requested to remain anonymous, was devastated to find out that her father had been responsible for this. She stated in a 2017 article that she has been in contact with two of her father's victims that hadn't reported the sexual abuse they suffered. His daughter was quoted as saying, But they have confided in me, and I believe them. Other families have come forward saying that Eileen has blood on her hands for not reporting her son, because if she did, there is a chance many other victims would have never encountered him. One relative who also does not wish to be named, claimed Eileen knew before Kylie was senselessly murdered in 1984 that her son had previously raped at least one young girl and bashed another with a hammer during a frenzied attack. This should have been a warning sign to authorities that he was likely to target yet another young girl, especially the part about the hammer attack. That should have been enough to keep him away. But... On the 25th of September, 1970, Gregory set his sights on a 14-year-old girl named Lucy. Whilst on the Hurst Bridge train, Lucy was on her way home from school and did not see him nor hear him until he started attacking her. She was hit several times on the head with a hammer and fell to the floor bleeding. It was then that this monster left the carriage, but he then came back and hit her again with the hammer on her shoulder. Lucy was found bleeding on the floor when the train stopped at Eltham. Gregory was, thankfully, arrested at the Diamond Creek station after a police officer noticed him on the platform. When the police officer spoke to him, he appeared nervous and the officer saw the blood-soaked hammer in a Gladstone bag Gregory was carrying. Lucy's parents were told that their daughter would likely die and that if she recovered, she would never walk again. However, Lucy proved the pessimistic doctors wrong and after a month in hospital was able to go home. But she had no feeling on her left side, and while her injuries improved with time, the psychological trauma would never heal. Researching this aspect of Gregory Davies, I could not find anything about his sentence, but had found that he had been sent to Ararat prison. And sadly, there wasn't any outline for how long he was sentenced for, but the Age found archival news articles showing that he was committed on a trial in November of 1970. He pleaded not guilty and was refused bail. With that in mind, I did look into the law to gain an understanding of what this sentencing could have been. Grievous bodily harm can carry a sentence between 7 to 25 years. Now for a fully grown man to beat a 14-year-old girl half to death on a train, you can only hope it was a longer sentence. But obviously, any rehabilitation he would have received would not have been enough, as 14 years later, he would kill. Had sentencing been stricter, he likely would not have been let out so quickly, as to then be able to take Kylie's life. Had this information been known at the time of Kylie's death, Gregory would have likely made it to being a suspect immediately. But he and his mother both said nothing when they were initially being questioned about it, leaving him free to continue sexually assaulting young girls. Even in 1996, this disgusting piece of shit was jailed for two and a half years for sexually attacking six young girls. I do have one question for this. How does sexually attacking six little girls only equate to two and a half years? Especially when he had served time already for violently attacking Lucy with a hammer. This is a pattern of behaviour that was discovered. So how could the justice system look at his history and say, 
two and a half years is enough. I digress. I'll get off my soapbox. It would take a grand total of 32 years until Gregory was finally arrested in relation to Kylie's murder, with one anonymous victim saying that they would press charges if it would help ensure that the charges would stick. Detectives arrested Gregory at the Waterford Park home he shared with his third wife on June the 6th, 2016 after the DNA they took from him two months earlier was found to match the DNA obtained from the semen left on Kylie's clothing. He was initially interviewed by police two days after the murder, during the original investigation. Sadly, at that time, they took him on his word when he gave them an alibi of being at a family barbecue. His daughter had visited him a few times after his sentencing to gain clarity over what he had done and was quoted as saying, If I had done something bad, and I didn't remember it, and someone told me, you've done this, and there was proof I had done it, I would feel absolutely horrified. I would be showing remorse, but he doesn't. He said to me the fact the DNA is his means he must have done it, but he doesn't show any feeling about it. Painfully, she only found out about her father's imprisonment when a cousin rang her to warn her in 2016 that he had been charged with murdering Kylie Mabry. Before his sentencing, while Gregory was in remand, prison justice took its first and only reported attempt against the saggy old flesh sack as he was attacked by another inmate. There are two versions of this story though. The first is he was standing in line to receive his nightly medication when he managed to anger his attacker, who then splashed scalding hot water on him, burning his face and upper body. The other version is, he was attacked by multiple fellow prisoners and had boiling water poured on his neck and groin, resulting in the need of skin grafts. The attacker later confessed, saying, he raped and killed a child. He should not be allowed to live, and he is unlikely to be charged for this assault. After this attack, Gregory's lawyer came forward to say, the reality is, nowhere is safe for him. The prosecution is seeking a life sentence. He will likely die in prison. And to that, honestly, I say good. Die scared, Gregory Keith Davies. It's still better than you deserve. And in good news, on the 21st of December, 2017, Gregory was sentenced by Lex Larsi in the Supreme Court of Victoria to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 28 years. He may be eligible for parole in 2045, when he will be 101 years old, assuming he makes it that long. And on that cheery note, that is all I have for you this week. As always, I'll be posting pictures relevant to the case on my Instagram and Facebook pages at What You Shouldn't Know Australia. And once again, I'm asking you for either your Australian ghost or true crime stories. Maybe send me a case request if you wish to. You can do all of that by sending me an email to whatyoushouldknowaustralia at gmail.com. If you are listening, make sure that you are following. And if you have a moment, it would mean the absolute world to me if you could give me a review. Maybe give me some stars. But until next week, stay safe and stay hydrated. Bye! (laughs) 